Hello and, and welcome everyone and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you on the unceded sovereign lands of the Watamadugal clan of the Darug Nation and some of you might have heard the cockatoos going home for tonight so good evening to everyone in that time zone and good morning to in particular our speakers who are joining in the morning time zone so very exciting continuation of our discussion tonight and exciting for a few reasons. One, because it's our first of our international speakers. We've got Esther from Wageningen in the Netherlands, Andy and Rob in the UK and Werner joining us from South Africa. So really exciting in that sense, but also exciting in terms of both the continuation of the discussion that comes out of the papers we're just about to hear, but also some of the gaps that today's, this session's presentations will start to fill. So for example, Werner is engaging very much with issues of use, which hasn't been much of the discussion so far, and welfare issues around animals. And then continuing around the critique of categorization that has occurred in the earlier sessions, we've got the two, two huge stars, but from very different disciplines, huge stars of the IPVEDS global assessment in Andy and Esther. And then moving on to Rob, filling this important um, gap, because we haven't, until Rob starts to speak, engaged with trees or um, this whole other order when talking, this whole other kingdom when, when talking about extinction. So really interesting topics that we'll be talking about right through. So before I go on to let you hear from the people you actually want to hear from, a few procedural issues. So as before, we have the chat box open and very much encouraging you to do what you've been doing all day. Feel free to enter into the chat box at any time and, and have discussions there, which I'll then direct to the speakers. I'll take, I'll take one burning question at the end of each presentation. And at the end, we'll have a group discussion. We can take questions from all the presenters there, then. And um, all presenters know that they have 15 to 20 minutes. I'll give you a sign at 15 minutes and then when you have two minutes left. And I'll then start getting a bit more agitated in my gestures. And if anyone goes far over the 20 minute mark, you'll start to hear something like this. But you get the idea. So now it gives me great pleasure to give you even more of an introduction to Werner Schultz, who is our first presenter for tonight, and his topic is ethical and humane use, intrinsic value in the Convention on Biological Diversity towards the reconfiguration of sustainable development and use. And Werner has had a range of leadership roles and he's moving from a leadership role as head of department at the Department of Public Law and Jurisprudence of the University of the, West, of the Western Cape in South Africa, moving soon to start in Southampton as the head of school and professor of global environmental law on the 1st of February. And importantly, has made a, many contributions through scholarship, but also through academic leadership in the area of um, international wildlife law and in particular animal welfare and um, environmental issues very much concerned with what he's going to be talking about tonight. And importantly, Werner also understands the many gifts that nature provides to people with an uh, interest in good wines particularly boutique wines, and also an appreciation of jazz and culture in that sense. So join me in giving a huge round of applause to Werner to welcome him to talk to us about this idea of the intersection between use, but humane use, perhaps, of animals. Werner, please. Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting introduction. Good morning, everyone. 
from South Africa. Uh, we have a sunny day today. Um, I shall discuss uh, yeah, from a legal perspective, this is my caveat, I'll discuss some legal issues pertaining to the Convention on Biological Diversity and, and then take questions. So without further ado, I don't want to immediately or hear the, the, the alarming bell that you've just sounded a while ago. So I'll just start immediately and commence with the discussion. Um, the point of the part of my discussion is essentially the COP7 decision, conference of the parties decision of the Convention on Biological Diversity number seven. Um, and it is the so-called sustainable use decision. Uh, and that is the point of departure of this whole discussion. This COP7 decision on sustainable use um, uh, includes an adoption of the so-called Addis Ababa principles and guidelines for sustainable use. So, for instance, um, principle 11 contains an operational guideline which states that sustainable use requires the promotion of a more efficient, ethical and humane use of components of biodiversity. biodiversity. So, and a very interesting link to that is principle 10 that refers to intrinsic value and therefore repeating the notion of intrinsic value that we can find in the preamble of the CBD. Now, the relevance of this uh, COP7 decision, as well as the, principle, the, the relevant principles that I just referred to, is the fact that it constitutes the foremost decision on sustainable use. For instance, the preamble refers to the fact that the principles, as well as the guidelines, are the tools to achieve the objectives uh, stated in the CBD, which includes conservation and sustainable use. So, very important for the notion of sustainable use, which constitutes one of the objectives of the CBD. Now, in terms of law also, if we consider the normative value of the COP7 decision, including the principles and guidelines, um, it is a very interesting discussion, which I'm not going to delve into, we don't have time, but essentially we can, I can provide a summation of the normative value and merely stating that it indeed represents a normative interpretation, at the very least, of sustainable use in the Convention on Biological Diversity. So it is quite obvious that we need to take cognizance of operational guideline principle 11 linked with principle 10 in the state sustainable use decision. It is very important. Now the question then is we, we, we can't find any reference to ethical and humane use in the CBD itself. So this is quite novel, this reference to ethical and humane use. What does it entail? What are the implications for sustainable use and sustainable development? I'll explain that later. In the Convention on Biological Diversity if we state that the legal value or legal status of the sustainable use decision is that it provides us with a normative interpretation of sustainable use in the Convention on Biological Diversity. And that will be my primary, the primary uh, issue that I will deal with during this presentation and I'll also link it to the issue of extinction in the concluding remarks. So what I will do briefly is just to Gain an understanding of the, of the, the terms ethical and humane use. I'll, I'll actually unpack it by a reference to a very groundbreaking or two groundbreaking uh, cases that we heard recently in South Africa. I'll also explain the international value, the global value of, those, of the case law that I've just referred to. And subsequently, I will unpack the issue of sustainable use, sustainable development linked to values in the Convention on Biological Diversity under the auspices of the case law that I've just described in order to fulfill this aim that I've just mentioned. So that is just part of the introduction. Now, if we turn to the case, the first case, and I'm not going to provide an ex a, a detailed exposition of the case law, but just briefly refer to the most relevant parts. Um, the National Society case um, was a very interesting case. And in this case law, it, it actually never dealt with wildlife welfare such, but cruelty against a, a, a certain animal, the slaughtering, the ritual slaughtering of a camel. And in this case, um, the, in the National Society case, a few interesting things emerged, uh, really very radical in terms of uh, current case law in South Africa, but also I think on the international plane. The first thing is that uh, the, the judges dealt with section 24, which is the environmental provision in our constitution and say that constitu constitutional values dictate a more caring attitude towards not only animals, but also humans and the environment in general. So sort of a, a, a reconciliation of individualism and holism, uh, species, but also individual animals. 
Um, specifically, the, 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 the judge just made it very clear. They placed the situation or uh, positioned it in terms of biodiversity, not only companion animals, but also wild animals. They referred, for instance, to case law um, in relation to rhino poaching, the Lemtong Thai case, where they specifically identified intrinsic value of individual animals as the rationale for welfare, for wildlife welfare, in terms of the environmental provision section 24, which never, there's no reference whatsoever to welfare, welfare of, of animals. It's a purely anthropocentric uh, formulation of an environmental provision. And the most interesting thing is, of course, the fact that the case then, the judges continue to indicate that animal welfare and conservation reflect two intertwined values. So they're not distinct, they're intertwined. And that is very interesting. Now, the next case um, that I'm just going to briefly refer to is a case, uh, the National Council of Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals versus the Minister of Environmental Affairs and other. That is the next case. Um, and in this case, there was a citation with approval of the case that I've just referred to. So that's the, the first thing. But what makes this case very interesting, and you, I've just included some of the issues, the facts and so forth, which I will not deal with. This case specifically deals with lions in captivity um, and utilization of and trade of those lions in captivity. And in this instance, the, the, if I can summarize the issue is uh, the, the, the minister or the applicants clearly indicated that in determining quotas for the 2017 2018 trade quotas, there was no recognition of wildlife welfare. And obviously they had in mind the previous case law, which made it clear that now wildlife welfare is part of section 24. The respondent, the minister stated, but there's no wealth, there's absolutely no reason to consider the wildlife welfare issue at all. And she actually made it clear that in terms of section 24, the concept of the constitution, there's a reference to sustainable use and sustainable development, but no welfare. And that was the gist of her argument. She even went as far as to say that the applicants, the, the NACP, uh, you, they, they abuse this issue of wildlife welfare and that sustainable development as such that is not concerned with the welfare factor. It's concerned with the environment. That's the first thing, of course. The, so, the, 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 the three aspects of the pillars of environment, economy, and the social. And there's no place for welfare. So that was her argument. Now, the court fully rejected in this case, uh, in this, uh, the arguments of respondents. Um, that is the next slide. And I just want to read this because it's, it's quite important, uh, where the court stated that they're suffering the conditions under which they are kept and the like remain a matter of public concern and are inextricably linked to how we instill respect for animals and the environment. So they, they affirm the importance essentially of welfare as a component of sustainable development under the auspices of Section 24, which is this environmental provision which encapsulates sustainable development as the primary objective of the environmental provision. And therefore, there was a contravention of this element of wildlife welfare um, in terms of Section 24, and, and, and they fully rejected uh, all the arguments of the respondents. So this is a very, very interesting decision that actually unpacked that welfare issue that was found in the previous NACP case. Now, why did I actually refer to uh, South African case law, because I mostly don't deal with international wildlife welfare. Wildlife welfare. What, are the what is the relevance of uh, the, the, the issues that I've just mentioned? But the, 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 so the, the first thing is that, that we need to reflect on the consequences for the interpretation of sustainable development and sustainable use. Um, it is very interesting that if we consider this case law in the context of biodiversity law, we can distill a few lessons. Now, uh, quite clearly, uh, this rejection of the argument of the minister means that wildlife welfare is now part and parcel of the sustainable development mantra in South African law. We're now dealing still with South African law, uh, South African law. And that intrinsic value presents the rationale for uh, the protection of the welfare of animals. So that is quite interesting. Now, if we move on to it uh, or move away from the South African landscape to the uh, international and global uh, for uh, we can, if we take cognizance of what I've just mentioned, this, these groundbreaking statements, essentially very, very radical statements, um, 
if we reflect on sustainable development, sustainable use, and values in the next slide, we will see that sustainable use, the definition of sustainable use, also does not refer, as I've mentioned, to ethical and humane. It's a very anthropocentric focus that we can find in terms of references to uh, the Brundtland definition of sustainable development. So no, no ethical humane use, never mentioned. Furthermore, of course, we know that sustainable use is the principle of operationalization of sustainable development. And we also know that CBD is, of course, a sustainable development agreement being signed in 1992 during the Rio conference. Um, the issue of sustainable development, the problem that I have with sustainable development, and we can discuss it further, is that it is ill-suited in cases of trade-offs between the environment and the economy. It doesn't prevent a, a satisfactory response to the implementation of this notion of sustainable development. I'd like to refer you to the case law that I've just mentioned. There's this focus on economic values that we frequently see in terms of international environmental law, which to an extent excludes non uh, 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 or excludes the non-instrumental values such as intrinsic value. So a very heavy focus on economic instrumentalism in terms of sustainable use in the CBD itself. Now, I don't want to deal with the, all the relevant values, but it is important to just revert back to what I've said previously, the reference to intrinsic value, which is a non-instrumental and rather non-anthropocentric value uh, that exists. Now, the preamble does refer to this, but what we see is that it is sort of, uh, it, is, it is something that, is, that, that does not really flow through to provisions of the CBD. If we take wildlife as a good example uh, in terms of the CBD, we can, it, it's a, it presents some interesting examples of the statement that I've just made and in support of what I've just said. Um, the one thing is, of course, that this dominant anthropocentric justification of biodiversity law by reference to the non-instrumental value, values fails to encapsulate the non-economic value of wildlife. So what we see in terms of C the CBD as well as international wildlife law is this focus on the prevention of extinction of species and not the welfare of species. So essentially, if we go back to the intrinsic value, intrinsic has two meanings, the phenotype and the genotype, the good of its own, the good of its kind. So there's a focus on the good of its own and an exclusion of the good of, uh, sorry, the good of its kind and the exclusion of the good of its own. So it's that, that the dichotomy between the individual animal and the holistic view that we frequently see also between exponents of animal rights and um, exponents of wildlife conservation. And the, the Convention on Biological Diversity accepts the consumptive, consumptive use of animal species if certain conditions are met. The problem is, of course, with this whole concept is that we as humans are interwoven with these so-called biological resources. We are not mere consumers because that is what a CBD essentially does. It, it preserves uh, uh, certain species for us to use later. And that is a very skewed sort of perspective on, on sustainable use. Now, I know my time is running out, so I need to be careful. Um, this still identifies need for law to respond to this overtly instrumental approach. That's the cartoon that I've just identified. A, a response to the needs of other species. So there needs to be a, a response that recognizes intrinsic value of species. And I've referred to the CBD that one can immediately say, but the CBD explicitly contains a reference to intrinsic value. But it's, a, it, it, it's sort of ornamental to an extent um, if you read the provisions of the CBD itself. And so, so my proposal resonates with um, the, the, the quote of Bowman Davies and Gretchwell in the Licensed International Wildlife Law which stated that any sound ethical policy should additionally have regard to the extent to which individual organisms are permitted to flourish in accordance with their biological nature. So that is what intrinsic value actually requires, the recognition of intrinsic value. And it, it currently does not uh, receive sufficient attention in terms of the CBD. So the sound ethical policy, this injection of non anthropocentric ethics of a more pluralist approach to ethics requires a normative wildlife welfare framework. And um, once again, in international wildlife uh, law, we do find some, some glimmers of hope for this. Uh, for instance, in the IWC, where there is reference to uh, humane treatment of individual or the 
this, this concept of humane treatment in CITES. But frequently these provisions are incidental. So we do have glimmers of hope that we can pursue, but it's not sufficient. Essentially, this issue of humane treatment in accordance with the intrinsic value, the good of its own interplay between good of its own and good of its kind, is prima facie compatible with sustainable use. Because it doesn't mean you, 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 uh, humans cannot use animals, so it does not contravene sustainable use, but it relates to the mitigation of suffering, of course, and it's something we can also unpack further. So essentially, what does that entail? I need to conclude now. I've got four minutes left. Um, so let me just uh, wrap up to an extent. What I've mentioned is the fact that there is a lacunae in the Convention on Biological Diversity. We have uh, the sustainable use decision in decision uh, seven, which provides this issue or pre presents ethical and humane use. I've given you a, a very uh, sort of a summation of what the implications could be in terms of South African case law. Now, what we see is for it, therefore the following. There is a need for sound ethical policy that gives effect to intrinsic value. And humane treatment, so the ethical policy in terms of intrinsic value, that leads to humane treatment of wildlife. So it's that marriage between uh, individualism and holism. The fortunate thing is, and this is my argument, that the sustainable use decision supports a so-called evolutionary interpretation of sustainable use, but also sustainable development in the CBD. That is the argument due to the normative legal status that the COP7 decision has. And that can be said uh, or can support the recognition of animal welfare. And we can find the motivation therefore once again in the preamble by reference to intrinsic value. Furthermore, the argument that animal welfare constitutes a general principle of international law in terms of Article 38 of the statutes of the ACJ, ICJ could strengthen this argument further due to the fact that it functions as a principle of interpretations. interpretation. It does not mean that all forms of pain and suffering should be prevented and that wildlife cannot be used, but wildlife cannot be used to satisfy human interests without sufficient justification. And essentially what my argument entails for all the, this, this presentation on the evolution interpretation is that it reconfigures sustainable development whereby animal welfare constitutes part and parcel of the environmental element in sustainable development. And in this manner, there's a recognition of non-anthropocentric ethics, a stronger focus thereon, which ultimately realigns the skewed factors of sustainable development, which I've referred to previously, this focus on economic values, so that the anthropocentric elements do not dominate. And it creates sort of a realignment um, and has the potential to infuse biodiversity law with non-anthropocentric ethics, not merely in, in an ornamental manner, um, as referred to in the preamble, but something that actually essentially infuses the provisions in the CBD itself. And um, just to, uh, during the last few uh, seconds that I have, a minute and a half, if one takes cognizance of South African case law, the interesting thing is it can actually contribute to my argument in the sense that in terms of traditional communication, where there's a dialogue between different courts all over the world, other courts that deal with similar issues can take cognizance of the groundbreaking decisions, but it can also strengthen the argument uh, uh, for the creation of a general principle of international law. So um, my, my, my advocacy for a uh, uh, reconfiguration of sustainable development by reference of the evolutionary interpretation of sustainable use is not radical at all. It actually resonates with the 18th General Assembly of the IUCN in 1990, which referred to ethical wise and sustainable use of some wildlife. It is not really new, it is not novel, and it's not radical. And we do have glimmers of hope currently existing in terms of law. And I think sustain, the sustainable use decision now provides the opportunity to pursue something else that is not merely consumption and preservation for human beings, but something that really responds to the needs of biodiversity law. And this integrative approach to sustainable, sustainable development and sustainable use can respond to extinction, not merely in a one-dimensional sense, merely functioning 
or, or merely focusing on the good of its own, but also recognizing the good of its kind, an important role that that actually plays in terms of biodiversity law. And in this sense, reconcile the needs of individual animals with the approach of conservation pertaining to species. I think this approach is very necessary because the extinction of speciesism um, in biodiversity law and this overtly anthropocentric approach is necessary in order to avoid mass extinction um, on our planet. The question now is that I've posed these, these arguments, and I hope convincing argu arguments we'll have to see. The question that I then ask myself, is law ready to be liberated in this sense? And could we also state that humans need to be liberated from, from this, this, uh, this need to master the planet? And I think that constitutes fertile ground for further discussions. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thanks a lot, Werner. And I'm about to invite one burning question. But before I do, I want to get my two cents in about how this links to the discussions we've been, how it builds on the discussions that we've been having in the earlier sessions. And two things really resonated with me. One was your framing, opening up that framing of intrinsic value and thinking about it in, in this depth of um, good of its kind versus good of its own and recognizing that those are different things. And the other way I think you build on some of the discussions we had this morning is we, some of the, a lot of the discussions were very much about how do we legislate differently? How can transformation occur in a design sense? But with those concrete examples of judicial interpretation, you've highlighted another avenue with which this discussion can occur. And we've got one burning question in the chat box, but, but before we do, I'd, I'd like to draw attention to Esther's point earlier on, because I think it really hits the nail on the head that, and she says it's a really important point that you are making, that intrinsic value is associated with conservation, and then all use is then framed in instrumental terms. So that the contradiction very much nailing the contradiction that you're highlighting there. But um, the question, the burning question here is from Union Win, and she says, hello, Mr. Schultz, is there any law relating to the prevention of cruelty against animals in your jurisdiction? Do we need sound national laws and effective enforcement actions for animal welfare? And very much echoing that yes prob probably we do and thank you for your impressive presentation mr schultz which is the the other point of the um message in the text box so perhaps a, a quick response to that and we'll, we'll open up for further discussion at, at the end thank you yes thank you michelle so uh, just in relation to the question that you just asked so uh, obviously uh, the south african jurisdiction mirrors um a worldwide trend where you have animal welfare provisions, anti-cruelty provisions, and legislation on domestic level for companion animals. And uh, there's an ignorance of the issue of wildlife welfare in relation to, well, well the issue of wildlife welfare. So we don't have statutes in the, and, and the, this, so this is, a, that, that's why I refer to the fact that the two cases are groundbreaking. Um, because suddenly, uh, in terms of, and this is an interesting thing, in terms of an anthropocentric environmental provision, prefers sustainable development um, and was coined, uh, was coined for the benefit of human beings. Uh, this, uh, the, the, this, this provision was used as the basis to um, pronounce on the need uh, in terms of the constitution for wildlife welfare. And what actually occurred subsequently is that there is currently kind of a process ongoing on the national level um, whereby there is a legislative amendment, amendment that will now make provision for wildlife welfare. So it, it, it actually, the, the decision in, and on, on the basis of the environmental provision spurred um, uh, reform, uh, legislative reform, uh, to make it explicitly clear that now wildlife welfare is an issue. And of course, um, on the international plane, it, it, it duplicates the, the, the legislative framework on the domestic level. So it's, what we still find is that international uh, welfare provisions are spares, they're incidental, but there is, has been a movement the past few years um, that I think 
may result in a process whereby this can change. So it is, I think it is changing. And the reason why I've actually referred to the case law is the fact that I think it not only provides interesting examples of what ethic and intrinsic entails and the legal consequences thereof um, on the basis of an environmental provision, but I think it can also contribute to global uh, dialogue on wildlife welfare. And it may also even influence this uh, identification of a convergence of um, animal welfare on international plane, due to the fact that you can, um, uh, for, for a general principle in international law to be identified, you can also use domestic uh, provisions and so forth in order to identify that. So I think that, that makes it quite interesting. That there's, there's, there's an incremental process currently ongoing on the international plane. And I may be extremely optimistic, I don't know, but, but I'm trying to identify what I prefer to those glimmers of hope. Well, thank you. Yes. Thanks, Lena. So we'll now move on to the beautiful alliteration of the next presentation, which is biodiversity and species extinction, categorization, calculation, and communication. And we're going to hear from Andy Purvis and Esther Turnhout, who have both been very much involved in the IPBES Global Assessment. Andy, you weren't here for this, but even while you slept, your work was being cited by Tom Van Doren in the last session in terms of that, that piece that you wrote, which I'm sure you're going to be talking about just now, about the furor that occurred once this, how did you come to this one million number of, of the global assessment? And um, by way of more introduction, um, Esther Turnhout is a professor at Wageningen University, an interdisciplinary social scientist, and also very much invo involved in the IPBES global assessment, particularly in the chapter looking at the governance issues and perhaps some of the solutions in terms of um, extinction. And importantly, Esther also has this incredible publication record looking from the outside at IPBES and at intergovernmental processes and the governance of that. So really interesting and we're really excited to have this conversation with Esther and Andy who led the very sciencey chapter of the global assessment and having uh, our polit political science, social science on the one hand combined with um, Andy who of his many, many accolades includes being a research leader, leader at the Natural History Museum and was previously a professor of biodiversity at, at Imperial College London and to have both of them come together to talk about this interconnected social science, science issue in relation to the IPBES Global Assessment. So take it away, Esther and Andy. All right, I'll start off um, by, by also uh, acknowledging Michelle's incredible contribution to that same chapter of the Global Assessment. And, um, and, and to just confirm that we are also quite excited about how this will play out. Um, and I think uh, what we what we want to talk about a little bit is what role extinction or the idea of species extinction played in the global assessments. Uh, reflect a little bit on that, um, and also take uh, take a step forward, a more future oriented outlook, to think a little bit more about what should perhaps the CBD take from the global assessments um, rather than, and this is going to be a central theme in our joint arguments, rather than a narrow focus on species and, and their extinction. And next slide please Andy. So first of all it's important to realize that uh, IPBES or the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services is kind of has shaped as part of a wider sort of implicit contract between science and global governance, uh, which, uh, which is basically based on the assumption that science, uh, provided that it's properly synthesized, assessed and communicated, uh, both can and should inform um, 
internet, international governance processes. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so um, as part of their contract, uh, it's already quite a while ago, it has launched the global assessment. Uh, and these uh, quotations are taken from the uh, press release that was um, based on the IPES assessment. Uh, it had a couple of key messages printed really in bold. And, and one of them was that a million species were threatened with extinction. Next slide, please. So, um, well, I certainly did not see that coming, but, maybe, but it was also because I'm rather new to this whole UN arena. Uh, but, uh, but the GA really uh, triggered a lot of media interest and responses. And um, there were many, many articles, many, many news media, uh, social media as well, in, in really um, quite renowned uh, newspapers and magazines, etc. One, one clear um, focus of a lot of that media interest was on this one million uh, species number. And I, like I said, I didn't see that coming, but I was also asked by a lot of press officers to talk about the global assessment um, and, and being confronted with that question, how do you know, how do you know one million species? That's quite impressive. Uh, next slide, please. And, and we move over to Andy. Thanks, Esther. Um, so the one million figure was a fairly late addition, uh, relatively late in the global assessment process because <clears throat> biodiversity is a very complex and multidimensional concept that we were encouraged to explore fully but then for the the communication and for the high level messages it's rather hard to make compelling resonant messages when you're dealing with abstract quantities so biodiversity is complex because as well as the things that you have genes population species communities ecosystems they have structure and they they have processes or functions associated with them and biodiversity is all of these things at all of these levels a difficulty that we have however is that many of these concepts on this figure like population structure community landscape are fuzzy one can disagree perfectly reasonably on where one starts and another ends. And so it's very hard as a basis for any kind of legal or policy framework to rely on fuzzy concepts because if you just get someone else to do the counting, you can have made any target that you like. Whereas species do have uh, an almost unique reality to them in this science in that we have uh, rigorous species concepts that al allow you to identify any individual to its species and because of a biological reality to species different people will come up with the same categorizations nearly all of the time also counting species is a relatively easy thing to do um, you know, operationally. And so counting species is one of the few hard numbers that you can get to measure biodiversity, but you know that you're only getting one level of one aspect of biodiversity when you do that. So we would love for species number to have the same role in biodiversity science that global temperature or PCO2 have in climate science as being the thing you want to know or the thing that controls all of the things you want to know. However, we know that we haven't got that. And it's worse, although species have an objective reality, 
we haven't done a brilliant job of documenting their diversity. We have a massive shortfall. We know pretty well there, there are disagreements over quite what fraction of species remain undescribed, but we think it's most of them. We have what's called the Linnaean shortfall. So we don't know how many species we've got. How can we know how many are threatened? How does the one million figure come about? So in order to know how many species are threatened, we need to know how many we've got, but we first of all, well, as well, we need to know what fraction of species are threatened. And the very wonderful recently departed Georgina Mace, together with Russ Landy, put together the IUCN Red List Categories and Criteria, providing an objective repeatable basis for assessing extinction risk of species. And these have been applied not across the whole of diversity, but to ever more groups of animals and plants and allow us now to generalize that on average, although it varies among groups, on average about 25% of species are threatened with extinction. But in insects, we don't know as much and what we know suggests it might be lower, but probably not lower than 10%. How many species do we think there are? Um, oh. We think that there's about two and a half million animal and plant species that aren't insects and about five and a half million species that are. And if you just multiply across, you get a bit more than half a million non-insects and a bit more than half a million insects. And so to one significant figure, you've got a million. And also we know roughly where they live, even the ones, in fact, especially the ones that we haven't described. They're concentrated in these hot spots of narrowly distributed species that are known as the biodiversity hotspots. And so if what we're trying to do through our policies and laws is prevent species extinction, we would focus our attention almost exclusively on these places. I want to move on to two different reasons for conservation and this picks up um, some of uh, Werner's um, uh, themes and also some of the discussion around it. On the one hand we need to stop extinctions because we need to stop extinctions. These species have a right to persist and we must not lose sight of that. But then the other reason is self-interest which is that human well-being down here is partly dependent on ecosystem services, which in turn depend ultimately on biodiversity mediated through getting ecosystems to provide what we need. These ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people, there are many different sorts of them and, and they range through instrumental things like energy, food and feed, but also things with relational value, physical and psychological experience supporting identities. Um, and then there's also future options, options for future generations. I'm going to do just two very extreme, very simple thought experiments here. One, if we lost all critically endangered species to extinction straight away, that would be a blow to maintaining future options. It would be a blow to some of these relational um, values. Um, psychological experience for instance but actually in terms of the instrumental value of nature it wouldn't make very much difference at all and that's because the ecosystem functions and services depend overwhelmingly on the common species not the rare ones so if we lost the critically endangered species socio-economic impacts would be very slender whereas if all wild populations shrank by 25 percent we would have no extinctions, but socioeconomic devastation because we would run out of food. So there's a very big mismatch. If we're just trying to conserve species, we know where to do it. If we're trying to maintain ecosystem services, that's a different set of places. And it shows that we need multiple targets in the framework that CBD are putting together over the next generations. We need targets not only around species, um, but also 
ecosystems, genetic diversity, and future ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people. Because these things are too separate to be encompassed by a single overarching goal. That's not to say, however, that they're completely orthogonal. And there are many actions that work at the intersections. So if we protect wilderness, it doesn't really help ecosystem services because there aren't people in them, but it does help these aspects of biodiversity. And then there's also this one here, restoring ecosystems that store a lot of carbon, a species rich in species that aren't found anywhere else. That would get you towards all four of these goals, but not to any of them. So we need multiple targets emphasizing holistic action. So a broader view of biodiversity than just species. But arguably, even the focus on all of biodiversity is too narrow. So this figure from Rayworth's Donut Economics book points out that we have to exploit nature to achieve the social foundation human rights rely on, but that if we crash through the ecological ceiling in any of these planetary boundaries, we compromise the ability of the planet to support ourselves and future generations. And what Rayworth argues is that we need to consider actions, laws, policies and frameworks in the whole to move towards the donut, both from outside and from inside. And so we have to be careful not to cast biodiversity conservation as intention with achieving the social foundation. The two things go together. And actually, the sorts of redistributional transformative changes that help to attain these social foundation goals would by themselves reduce human pressure on nature. So I'm going to pass with that back over to Esther. Yeah, so what that suggests, and this is, um, and this is really something that, uh, that is becoming increasingly clear in, in different sorts of venues and workshops that I've engaged with, is that um, biodiversity conservation or um, um, reducing extinction or loss of biodiversity is, is really um, has to go quite widely beyond the scope of biodiversity as it's commonly understood. And, because, and since uh, the global assessment also quite clearly concluded that, uh, like Andy also said, just reducing human pressures uh, goes a long way in, in, into achieving those objectives all at the same time. Um, of course, you, you start to see that biodiversity knowledge becomes quite threatening to vested interests. So partly this is a result of, um, of this contract where we believe that science is instrumental for governance purposes. And when that science uh, starts to threaten um, established interests, of course you invite, you almost invite um, the emergence of uh, denialism. And again, this was really a surprise to me, but I guess it shows how new I am to this field. We indeed saw, in parallel to what we've seen with climate, also the emergence of extinction denialism. And the one that has probably experienced most of that um, has been Andy, I think, <laughs> on the basis of this one million number. And these are just two quotations that I took from some of the responses we've seen. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're suggesting actually is uh, for global biodiversity science to properly inform um, governance and law. Um, it, it needs to move actually beyond such a narrow contract where, where uh, science provides the numbers for policy making to take up. And I think IPES has already made really important steps in into that direction in harnessing or trying to synthesize and assess a wide diversity of expertise and also the whole process of creating a global assessment has um, has elements of what you could call democratization or co-production where science is really placed in the middle of uh, public discussions 
The next slide, please. I think what it also really resonated with, uh, we just briefly talked about this before the meeting uh, formally started, is that we need to really think hard about what this concept of biodiversity um, means to many people and what it uh, and how we could reframe those meanings. I guess if you look at the conservation community, biodiversity means uh, wilderness areas and I iconic wildlife, put it very bluntly. Uh, as, as Andy has quite convincingly shown, I think um, it needs to be about much more than that if it has any chance to secure uh, human and social uh, well-being at the same time. So legitimate, um, oh yeah, yeah, please move on, so I'll conclude. So what, what kind of conclusion do we draw from this? And there's a lot here, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, how, how should we present biodiversity and how we, should we represent biodiversity and its loss? And I think this is true in science, in policy, in law, in all of these, uh, and in conservation practice as well. Uh, we should be asking four main questions. What are we losing? How do we know? Why should we care? And what should we do? And I think for all of these four, uh, we suggest uh, a, a broadening and a reframing and an opening up uh, where we uh, believe that what are we losing? Uh, we need to go beyond sweeping statements about humankind is destroying nature. I don't know if you've seen um, uh, yesterday uh, was on my Twitter feed that that's a that's a that's a moving comment perhaps but it's also an unhelpful comment because actually mankind isn't doing that it is a specific portion of the human population that is having a massive impact uh, and that's where the responsibility should be attributed um, express who is losing what and all of the different elements are part of biodiversity including equality, justice, and dignified human ways of living, actually as a powerful inroad and a powerful focus of biodiversity conservation that I think hitherto is being um, largely ignored. Uh, how do we know uh, we need an effort to diversify and also decolonize biodiversity science? Uh, why should we care? expanding the range of uh, values and also attributing ethical as well as instrumental reasons to to all of these items and i think Werner really made me think about that and how how narrow our thinking has been and my narrow, my thinking has been about this as well and what should we do again focusing on attributing appropriate causes and responsibility uh, and trying to prevent generalization and abstraction. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Esther and Andy. And um, as you're thinking of your one burning question, I thought it was interesting how at the end that Esther's talking not only about the political nature of the discussion that they've both had, but also about Twitter. And then if you go and look at Andy's Twitter profile, interesting how the bit that he's highlighted is the part of the IPBES Global Assessment, which says, by its very nature, transformative change can expect opposition from those with interests vested in the status quo. But importantly, there's another part of that sentence, which says, such opposition can be overcome for the broader public good. So to me, that presentation was in many ways encapsulating the interaction that needs to occur across disciplines and as Esther ended on the different ways of knowing as well and an excellent set of questions at the end. Does anyone have a burning question? But Esther and Andy. Oh, I have a question, Michelle. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so the, I think from a very interesting presentation. I, I benefited tremendously from this due to the fact that um, I'm a lawyer and require, you know, this type of information um, to also broaden my, my perspective and so forth. So just two things. The one thing is, of course, uh, we protect what we value. 
And that's why I focus on the issue of intrinsic value versus instrumental value. And, and Andy, you've just uh, sort of uh, accentuated the fact that um, there's still, if, if, we, if we only protect ecosystem services, I think we'll have a bit of a problem. So this, this sort of this exclusion of non-economic values. Um, so that's the one thing that I found very interesting. And, and it seems to be the support to an extent what I've, what I've tried to argue. But what I also linked to that I find very interesting is we as lawyers tend to you know, generalize. Uh, and we talk about biodiversity and all these aspects because it's included in law. We don't have the knowledge that you, of course, have as natural science, from the natural science perspective to really interrogate these aspects. And the one thing that I just, when you discussed all these aspects, the, the issue of complexity. So biodiversity, you've mentioned it, and it's extremely complex. So as lawyers, we don't, we don't really interrogate the complexity of biodiversity because it's in the CBD and we just, you know, we just go with the flow and work with it. So my, my problem is, and, and, I, and I hinted at it, but didn't really want to delve into it, is the fact that um, you made it very clear that biodiversity is extremely complex. And my problem is that the way in which the CBD is actually um, formulated is it, it, I have a feeling that sometimes it, it sort of negates the complexity of biodiversity as if we um, have sufficient knowledge in order to understand the dynamics and the complexity and the interaction between species and ecosystems and habitat and human beings and all these things. Um, which, so, so for me, the, the, the feeling that I sometimes have or the, um, the idea that I sometimes have is that the biodiversity, tend, uh, the convention tends to negate some of the complexity that exists. So, and that's what I've mentioned uh, uh, previously. So we now use and conserve. And, you know, it's sort of simplistic, but, but it's not. And, and I'm just wondering whether this is not one of the very problematic aspects underlying the, the CBD, which is, I'm not saying it's, it's, you know, it's not a good convention, but I think that is a very problematic aspect. The, the perception or the approach, the mentality that we have sort of knowledge. I know there's a pre, uh, precautionary principle, but with, in, in essence that we have knowledge in order to decide how do we use and how do we conserve. And that seems to me a very problematic aspect. Thank you very much. Thanks, I could, I, yeah, I could I could respond to that, but Andy will also probably say something completely different. So, so yeah, I agree. The CBD has problems, and um, one of the problems is uh, common in a biodiversity policy in I think many countries as well is that it's a sectoral, it's a sector. So we have economic policy and that is something else than biodiversity policy. So what I find really interesting and very powerful is that we see that um, uh, human rights law is increasingly applied to environmental issues. Um, so issues of justice for future generations, for example, has been successfully applied to environmental issues. And the discussions on eco side are also, I think, to some extent taking place be beyond the narrow focus on to what we understand as biodiversity policy and law. And, and, and I think that is, I, I don't like the, that all of these discussions are taking place in legal terms. Uh, it would be better if we wouldn't always have to resort to court cases for these issues, but this is powerful. And this is, I think, uh, this has been very inspirational to me. So achieving equity and justice globally, if that includes um, actually combating uh, wealth and overproduction and overconsumption are, the tools I think we should be using right now to conserve biodiversity. I completely agree in surprise for Esther. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
Thanks, Andy. I can see that Judy Fisher has her hand up and I would say one burning question because it's you, Judy. It's very nice to have the who's who of IFBES here. Judy is, the, is on the multidisciplinary expert panel of IFBES and has extensive knowledge, particularly around Indigenous and local knowledge. Please go ahead, Judy. Uh, thank you both Esther and Andy. Um, it's really nice to hear something about IFBES happening in Australia because not much of it is heard here. So thank you very much for that. That's fantastic and for the organisers. I think Esther probably in a way answered what I was wanting to say, not so much a question, but thank you for bringing the whole concept about multidisciplinarity and moving away from this species driven approach, which for my long time in 30 years in this world, it's always worried me. So thank you very much for that. My question was, what is the solution to um, the discussion that we've had? So Esther, perhaps you've answered that, but if you have any further questions or comments, Esther or Andy, um, you may have answered it when you were talking about justice and ecocide, but perhaps there's other comments either of you might like to make. So thank you very much. Well, perhaps I could add that, um, that when you look at the, 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 the negotiations around the post-2020 framework, um, there's there's an urgent need to step up to step up the the way the conversations are going um, and the Aichi targets were really nice in a way and we've achieved none of them and um, I, I really fear that um, the current framework will just copy or even lower uh, the ambition levels so I really am not I have no solution here, but I but uh, but I have this big concern that we're falling into the same trap, and and I don't I mean the whole UN sphere has become very depoliticized, so so for for reasons that probably have very little to do with knowledge or the recognition of complexity and biodiversity, will hang on to protected areas and species, because that's what we can agree on at the global level, even if we're, even if we're not even implementing that. So I don't want to be really pessimistic here, but I think for the post 2020 framework, there is still time to, um, to try and get some of these uh, broader concepts and more powerful tools and options into into the discussions. So I'd just like to add to that, that um, I think there is uh, a growing, uh, a very rapidly growing recognition that efforts do have to be stepped up. Um, in the UK, one of the developments just in the last few months is that the government have, have started to view environmental issues as whole of government issues, rather than setting the environment ministry in competition with all of the other ministries. Mm. Um, and that, that's a very welcome sort of enabling action that I think many governments could perhaps take. You know, it, it doesn't actually cost anything now, and it, it enables the whole of government to look for the synergies and the co-benefits rather than having um, different government programs in complete opposition to each other, both spending money like nobody's business. So I, I think there are, there are some grounds for optimism, um, but there are also <laughs> some grounds for pessimism. Yeah. Thank you both. Did you say UK, Andy? Did I hear that right? Yeah. Ah, incredible. <laughs> Every now and again, purely by accident, <laughs> we do something good. <laughs> Thank you all. And we'll continue this discussion after we've heard from Rob Amos, and he's going to be talking to us about finding space for the conservation of trees in international environmental law. And all of you would have received the abstracts of all the papers that have been presented throughout the workshop. And Rob starts his by saying, the conservation of plants has typically been neglected in legal scholarship, 
Well, if it weren't for you, Rob, they'd be neglected in this workshop too. So thank you very much. And Rob is a research fellow based at UCL's Faculty of Laws. And he's not only working academically, but also in ways in which we can engage more for sustainability. For example, uh, developing sustainability tours, global citizenship programs at UCL, etc., etc. He's just had one book come out on international conservation law, another one just about to come out on um, protection of plants in theory and practice. So we are very happy to have you here, Rob, for filling this gap in the discussion about extinction. Take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just share the screen. All right, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so the conservation of plants in international law, uh, even if we just focus on trees, is a huge topic. Um, it basically encompasses all of international environmental law and another, uh, a series of important topics in wider public international law as well. So what I'm going to do today is just focus on particular issues that I think illustrate why it is that the law struggles to address plant diversity loss. So I will discuss how it is that society values trees and the implications of this for their legal protection. I will then briefly examine the opportunities and risks associated with using trees to tackle climate change before highlighting a tension between international law's typical approach to invasive alien species and the role these species may play in helping to restore degraded ecosystems. And this last point is particularly important because I don't think it's enough for us to just be discussing an environmental laws extinction problem. Uh, our failure to halt the decline in plant and wider biodiversity loss means that we must also now begin to consider environmental laws extinction solutions. First though, I want to set out some of the context behind my work. So in their 2016 report, Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, which is one of the UK's leading botanical institutions, estimates that around a fifth of all plant species are at risk of extinction. In their 2017 report, Kew highlighted some of the causes of this, including climate change, habitat loss, and invasive alien species. So in other words, the consequences of human activity. Uh, despite this, uh, plants have been neglected in a legal scholarship that focuses primarily on animals. Few, if any, books have chapters that specifically address the challenges in protecting and conserving plants, with the only text, legal text at least, dedicated exclusively to pl plants prior to the publication of my recent book being De Clem's. And De Clem's book was published before the Biodiversity Convention was adopted, which tells you all you need to know about its contemporary relevance. This lack of attention applies equally to the texts of key conservation agreements and plants were almost completely left out of CITES, for example, until someone realized towards the end of the negotiations that they are a part of nature too. Now, I'm sure that I do not need to go into the fundamental ecological importance of plant life in any detail. Even if you know very little about plant ecology, that plants are the basis of every food chain and almost every habitat on earth tells you what is at stake if we allow more and more plants to disappear. If their ecological importance was not enough, and sadly for some people this really isn't, then plants provide a range of ecosystem services and other benefits to humans. Uh, to give one example, plants are of great significance to the pharmaceuticals industry, and previous research into this plant, the colchicum, um, has explored its possibility as a cancer treatment. Now fortunately the IUCN lists this plant as being of least concern in their red list, although this is based on a 2014 assessment and so of course may have changed. There are thousands of other plants however, some of which may still be unknown to science, that are at risk of extinction and when they disappear any possible cures and treatments will disappear with them. Humans also use plants to help them achieve their social goals. Uh, I return to this later in my talk, but to give one example now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change argue that carbon negative technologies, 
that is technologies that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, will be crucial if we are to achieve the 2015 Paris Agreement goals of keeping the global temperature rise to below 2 degrees C. Bioenergy carbon capture and storage is one such process, but its success will depend on the development of a sufficiently large biofuels industry. The plants will obviously be central to this, although creating such an industry raises its own concerns, uh, particularly the land use implications. Contributing to social goals is just one way that plants can be said to participate in society. The others being how they shape social spaces and influence individual and collective human behaviours. And this participation and its continuing effect on human society further highlights the need for humanity to take urgent and effective action to halt the decline in plant diversity loss. This will never happen, however, while environmental law and policy are based on an ecologically flawed understanding of the value of plants. Now, as we've already heard this morning, uh, there are lots of different ways we can frame the value of nature, and I use the five interpretations set out on the slide. Now, this is not to criticise how others have categorised the different values of nature, but I am of the view that if we are to develop long-term conservation strategies, we need first as a society to reach a consensus on not only how we value nature, but of the importance of basing law and policy on its ecological value. And to do this, we need to clearly and simply distinguish between the different value types, which is what I hope these five interpretations achieve. Now, each of these value types may be identified in international environmental law, although, as we've heard this morning, some only superficially. So, as Werner mentions, the preamble to the Biodiversity Convention recognises the intrinsic value of nature. But when you go on to read the rest of the text, you see that it arguably only pursues conservation as a way of perpetuating the sustainable use of nature, rather than as an end in itself. International conservation law is overwhelmingly based on the instrumental values of nature and indeed international environmental law more generally. And this is particularly true of forest conservation agreements. So the 1992 forest principles do not even identify forest conservation as a global concern and instead present it as a question of national resource use. The same applies to the 2007 instrument although this at least places greater emphasis on promoting the sustainable use of forest resources. More recent agreements may be considered sounder conservation instruments. So the Biodiversity Convention's 2014 Forest Ecosystem Restoration Initiative focused on capacity building and implementation support to aid states in halting deforestation and the associated biodiversity loss. Uh, this initiative was intended to help states achieve targets 5, 11 and 15 of the Aichi biodiversity targets, which broadly address habitat degradation, protected areas and climate change adaptation, respectively. But that the fifth global biodiversity outlook that was recently published concludes that targets 5 and 15 were not met and target 11 was only partially met, highlights the weaknesses of non-binding approaches to conservation. There has been more encouraging action at the regional level recently and following last year's forest fires in the Amazon, a number of states came together to agree the Leticia Pact. This still shares some of the weaknesses of global forest instruments as it still emphasises the role of national action, but it does go further in calling for coordinated transboundary approaches to forest conservation. Importantly, it also explicitly calls on states to restore the ecological values of forest, and so it goes further than other agreements in viewing forests in non-anthropocentric terms. However, you only need to look at the attitude of the current president of Brazil to see that you can have the best international agreement in the world, but it will be of limited use if there isn't sufficient support at the national level. Now, it is my belief that it is this emphasis on the instrumental value of forests and nature more widely that is a root cause of our inability to halt biodiversity decline. If we shift the emphasis of our instrumental valuations from how we can use nature to how we can work with it to address global challenges, however, instrumental value may be a powerful incentive for conservation. 
So as I noted earlier, we use plants to help us achieve social goals. In terms of climate change, we do this through the use of plants as biofuels, but also through the protection and planting of trees and climate change mitigation strategies. Most notably through the Red Plus programme of the UNFCCC. Now the basic rationale behind Red Plus is to make forests more valuable to states if they are kept intact rather than if they were cleared for other land uses through the promotion of projects and partnerships that focus on conservation. As with other forest mechanisms, Red Plus is centred on national action and through the 2013 Warsaw Framework, which was a series of UNFCCC COP decisions, states are encouraged to designate a national authority to coordinate Red Plus's implementation, instead of the type of supranational institutional oversight that has been established for the Clean Development Mechanism, which as I'm sure you know, is another important UNFCCC programme. The role of the UNFCCC in Red Plus is instead more facilitative, focusing particularly on the collection and sharing of information and best practice. Now this is a very positive use of nature's instrumental value, but by connecting forest value with the amount of carbon dioxide they sequester, there is a risk that this will result in the prioritization of the protection and planting of species that absorb the most CO2, rather than maintaining natural forest diversity. In, rec in recognition of this, at COP16, the Cancun safeguards were adopted, which aim to ensure that Red Plus funded projects actively pursue the conservation of natural forests. Uh, Savaresi, however, believes that there needs to be proper institutional oversight of forest related activities at the international level to ensure this happens along similar lines to the clean development mechanism. But the issue with this, as we have seen in relation to global forest conservation agreements, is that states are determined to frame forest conservation as primarily a national concern. So the political feasibility of Savaresi's proposals are debatable. Long, in contrast, looks to enhance the financial incentives of Red Plus by making projects that meet certain ecological criteria uh, such as increasing the population of native tree species eligible for additional financial support. This may be more politically acceptable, but it raises implementation issues of its own. So it would be necessary, for example, to have sufficient baseline data so that any population increases can be properly measured and this data isn't always available or easily attainable. So Red Plus is an important tool, but ultimately the only way we are going to meaningfully address climate change is through dramatic emissions reductions. Even if we were to cut our carbon emissions to zero tomorrow, however, a certain amount of ecological degradation has now been locked into the system. Certain habitats will consequently undergo significant change, and may, as a result of this, no longer be ecologically capable of supporting certain species. And for conservationists, this is obviously a serious concern. Reintroducing species into the wild is only possible if there is an area of the wild in which they can be reintroduced. If their former range is no longer ecologically suitable, new areas, if they exist, I mean, where could we relocate a polar bear to when the Arctic finally becomes too warm to support them? Uh, so these new areas will need to be identified, but doing so would effectively mean deliberately introducing an alien species into the wild. Now, in, now intentional introductions of alien species is permitted under international law, and principle 10 of the Biodiversity Convention's Guiding Principles on Invasive Alien Species permits this subject to risk assessment and the prior informed consent of the host state. Notwithstanding this, however, international environmental law rightly treats alien invasive species as a key driver of biodiversity loss. In his new wild hypothesis, however, Fred Pierce takes an entirely different approach. He argues that alien species represent nature's capacity to adapt in the face of anthropogenic pressures and should therefore be seen as establishing new ecosystemic relationships rather than destroying old ones. To support his case, Pierce refers to the new forests that have emerged on Puerto Rico, 
So historically, a huge amount of deforestation has taken place in Puerto Rico to make room for agriculture. When the agricultural sector collapsed, much of this land was abandoned, but, the, but because the soil had been so badly degraded, it was no longer suitable for many of the native tree species. Instead, it was the alien species that had been introduced by the forestry, se forestry sector and as ornamental garden plants that were able to colonize the abandoned farms. These species allowed the soil to regenerate, which eventually allowed some, although not all, of the cleared native species to return. Now, I am in two minds about Pierce's arguments. Um, on the one hand, alien species, whether intentionally or inadvertently released, have had devastating impacts on ecosystems. We only need to look at cane toads in Australia to see what the risks are. My instinct is that more support for ecosystem restoration initiatives based on native species would be of greater benefit. Uh, I do not have time today to go into the legal frameworks for ecosystem restoration or the wider philosophy and practice of rewilding in any detail. But there are numerous examples of how reintroducing once native species can have a transformational effect on the health of ecosystems. So in Yellowstone, for example, the reintroduction of wolves changed the behavior of deer so that they spent less time by the riverbanks where they could be easily ambushed. This allowed the trees and other vegetation by the rivers to recover which in turn stabilized the riverbanks and supported riparian ecosystems. On the other hand, what Pierce says has some merit. If alien species are able to take advantage of landscapes that we have detrimentally transformed in a way that native species cannot, then as experience on Puerto Rico indicates, they may have an important role to play in ecological recovery. Eradicating the non-native trees that were the first to take advantage of the abandoned farms would have crippled their ecological recovery. If the history of conservation policy and practice has taught us anything, it is that success only comes when we work with nature. Trying to impose our vision of what nature should be, whether this is based on romantic ideals of pristine wilderness or the belief that we need to replicate what we have destroyed, will be extremely costly and ultimately self-defeating. So this tension represented by the new world is something that I've touched on in my previous work and is something that I am hope to explore further in the near future when I cross off the 101 other things on my to-do list. Um, so to conclude, the conservation of trees raises some important questions for international environmental law. It challenges us to change our perceptions of the value of plants so that we emphasize the ecological over the instrumental. Even in mechanisms such as Red Plus, which positively seek to use the instrumental value of forests to justify their protection, more needs to be done to ensure that proper attention is paid to the ecological value of forests and the individual species of flora and fauna that they comprise. Ultimately, however, we need to accept that fundamental and irreversible ecological change is already happening. Some species are going to decline and disappear, and others will need to colonize new areas if they are to survive. Pierce's new wild hypothesis urges us to embrace this change as an opportunity. His laissez-faire attitude to alien species is, however, contrary to mainstream conservation law and practice and should not be seen as a substitute for ecosystem restoration efforts based on returning native species to their former range. Where this is ecologically impossible, however, environmental law may have to adapt so that alien species and the new wild they represent are seen as a solution to, rather than a part of, our extinction problem. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rob. And I wish you, I know it would have been crazy o'clock in the morning, in the night for you, but I wish you were here for Leslie Hughes's presentation this morning because the, the essentially, and you would be pleased to know that she's a plant ecologist, even though her examples were in um, the zoological space, but the call to arms to think differently about our relationships with nature and as, as you put it, how we work with nature is something 
that resonates across the, the two pieces and in some ways a very difficult task when our connection is based on thousands of years, millennia of, of a particular type of interaction with nature. So thank you very much for, for that. Anyone have a burning question for Rob? I'll stun them into silence. <laughs> Michelle, uh, uh, may I ask a question, perhaps? Go ahead, Werner, please. Make mention of something. Thank you. I don't want to impose, because I've already had an opportunity to ask a question, but now I, I can ask it with a clear conscience. So, Rob, this was a fascinating and appalling presentation, and also due to the fact that I'm, I'm one of the, the sort of the ignorant international environmental lawyers that tend to ignore the importance of plants and just focus on, of course, on wild animals. So for me, it was also extremely interesting and a sort of wake up call um, to remind me of the fact that biodiversity is, is broader than just focusing on uh, of, uh, you know, wild animals and so forth. Uh, just one thing maybe, um, your presentation, um, it made me think immediately when I saw the title of the enthralling piece of Lawrence Stripe uh, that he wrote, I think was it 50 years ago or so, a very interesting piece on plastic trees and of course, in the Christopher Stone publication, also she trees outstanding because it, 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 those those uh, publications invoke the issue once again of values that we discussed this morning. Um, and I just want to know whether you've considered uh, the decision that I've uh, that I've actually presented uh, the sustainable use decision because the sustainable use decision, the operational principles ten and eleven, and the decision itself, of course, um, does not pertain merely to wildlife, although I, I'm. No, I may have created the impression that it does. That's just due to the fact that I focus on wildlife. And I just wondered whether the, the, the fact that it, um, you know, the ornamental flavor that intrinsic value has in the preamble of CBD, which I think this, the, the, this decision seven, I mean, it, it sort of infuses, the, or it has the possibility to infuse the interpretation of sustainable use with a more ethical perspective. Um, and you've referred to the fact that it's most instrumental, there's the, the inherent values, but the, the possibility of really moving towards or more in, really intrinsic perspective or intrinsic values in relation to also plants. And I just, I just wondered whether you've, we, we, whether you've dealt with the decision itself in the context of the interesting work that you have done. You. Um, so I've not addressed that decision specifically, but I have looked more broadly at sort of ecocentric rationales for plant conservation, uh, including Christopher Stone works and wild law work. Um, and I certainly think intrinsic law, intrinsic value, sorry, has an important role to play in introducing a more normative element into discussions of conservation. And I think we're seeing that breakthrough now um, in sort of law and policy contexts uh, with sort of the the advancements in nature's rights we've seen in New Zealand, obviously there's a very specific context to the recognition of those rights. Um, there was some comments in the Rio plus 20 outcome document about Mother Earth that we haven't seen before, uh, which again just creates that space. My issue really with intrinsic value as our primary, primary basis for conservation is that it focuses on individuals um, rather than ecosystemic relationships. So you could argue that we could pursue an in intrinsic approach to conservation just through zoos. I mean, they could be the most amazing zoos in the world, but we are in zoos conserving individual species. But if, if we just base conservation on that, uh, ecosystems will collapse which is why I think it's more important for us to focus on ecological relationships, which conservation practice, um, I think, now gets. I mean, the Georgina Mace was mentioned earlier, and Georgina Mace has published an excellent article, I think it's in Science or perhaps Nature Communications, where she charts the evolution of conservation practice from a very siloed approach of looking at individual species, individual habitats, individual threats, to now looking at the relationships, not just within nature, but between nature and society. And I think the law is getting there slowly, 
but because our main international conservation agreements are decades old, they're still wedded to that siloed approach and haven't yet made that intellectual leap uh, to a more relationships model. Thanks, Rob. Afshin had his hand up. Um, Rob, thanks for that uh, presentation and thank you for your work. I, I think it's fantastic to see, um, I guess, more sustained attention brought to trees and plants and stuff like that. I, I myself have an interest in in a different dimension of trees, which is their capacity to have a, a social existence and relationship with their environment and how they connect and entangled and stuff like that. But I, I, I had two different types of questions. One is, uh, I, I think that there's um, often, uh, you know, trees like invertebrates, I think I just boxed into one type of, they're caricatured in a particular way and I think that takes away from the, the disc nature of the discussion we have about trees. And I guess my question to you was, you know, do you, see, do you see a diversified way in which international law has in various instruments deals with trees? But there's another type of question I have as well, which is that, do you think that part of your critique of conservation and your book in international law is because perhaps dom unlike other areas in domestic law the and in domestic contexts the governance regimes around trees are probably far older and sustained and developed and i guess what i'm thinking about is in the context of say australia like where i live i'm not allowed to touch hardly any trees around me um, and so the conservation regime for trees is so well developed and uh, the compliance regimes are so sustained and so uh, sophisticated that I wonder if that's put pressure on international law to not need to develop or, or not. So I guess this is my, my second question is about the tensions between domestic and international and whether the critique of international law is perhaps um, uh, more complex because of how domestic systems have for some of them anyway for such a long time dealt in very sophisticated way with trees so just some questions to I guess explore um, so on your second question I think there may be an element of that um, but I think when you look at uh, international conservation regimes um, with the possible exception of perhaps CITES, they very much focus on national action anyway. Um, so I think, I mean, you know, the CBD does not impose any real uh, restrictions on state activities uh, the, because of that phrase as appropriate and possible, whatever it is. Um, so I don't think, I think if states wanted to create a proper forest conservation instrument that still left space for uh, well-established national approaches, they could do it if they really wanted to. Um, I think the bigger issue is that forests are primarily seen um, as an economic resource and states are reluctant to cede any control um, over how they manage forest as a resource. Um, in terms of the first question, well, you know, are trees sort of boxed into a certain category? I think that certainly is the case and I think it applies to plants as a kingdom. Um, so for example, when I was looking into the impacts of climate change on plants, there are a number of studies that say that actually as a whole, plant life is benef benefiting from climate change because of the warmer temperatures, uh, more rainfall, so they've got a longer uh, growing season. So you can actually track a greening of the earth over the last couple of decades. The problem is uh, plant diversity is decreasing because it's only specific types of plants that are able to take advantage of these um, changing conditions. Um, so grasses are doing particularly well, but polar and uh, mountain species are struggling because if they're adapted to cold temperatures, um, as temperatures rise, their growing range retreats. 
Um, so if you take mountain plants, for example, there is only so much more mountain they can climb before they run out of mountain. Um, and that distinction, it, it's just not there um, as a rule in conservation agreements, even in instruments that address, you know, mountain conservation. They do not distinguish between uh, mountain trees that are probably quite happy at the moment and the very specialist alpine endemic plants that are at real risk of disappearing. It's mm. great. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Rob, and thanks to all our speakers. I know, Philippa, you have your hand up, and I'm sure it would have been a really, really good question. It always is, but I'm conscious of what the time is and also the amount of energy you've all put into this session, both as active listeners, but importantly to our speakers. So thank you all so very, very much, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow in our time zone, which would be morning in our time, but you're clever people, you can work it out. So see you in the morning or whatever time that corresponds to wherever you are on earth. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.